Let the church say amen. Ah, oh, what a good God we serve. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. So, our pursuit today is to understand something about peace. And, and I, th- I think that we have laid a foundation for, for a discovery that sometimes our greatest peace for the future is in remembering the great faithfulness of God in our past. So I pray that this meets you somewhere today. This is the third part of an ongoing series that we're calling Fruitful. And the basic premise of this this journey that we're making in this new sermon series, every week I want to repeat it so that it kind of gets into the, the bloodstream a little bit. When you think about what is the point of this whole thing? I mean, like the whole thing. What is the point of this that we do when we gather for church? And, and, and I've been saying it this way. The chief aim and the end game of the Christian life is to become more and more and more like him the longer we live. So much so that we live in such yieldedness to the power of God's love working in us that we actually mature into the very character of the God we see in the face of Jesus Christ. And, and even though I could pull any one of us aside in this worship gathering and say, don't you want to be like Jesus? Don't you want to be a little more like him? Don't you want to talk like him and walk like him and live in this world a little more like him? Every one of us would say, absolutely. And most of us would, with, without examining the, the, the pathway to becoming like Christ, we would assume that it, it comes only by really trying. <laughs> that if I just really kind of want it, And if I just really, you know, this time I messed up, last time I failed him before, but if I really just try harder, then then maybe I'll suddenly wake up and I'm I'm a little bit more like him. And the truth is that is a, a failure waiting to happen. Because what I've been trying to say these first three weeks, and I hope that it's in your heart and in your head by now, that the secret to the Christ like life is not in striving but in surrendering. The secret to the Christ-like life is not in striving, but in surrendering, in yielding our lives so greatly every day that we, we yield to the power of God's Spirit to do something in us that we simply can't do on our own, or you may say to grow something in us that we can't grow on our own. That's why we call it fruit. And Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 remind us of this pursuit. For the love, for the the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And today, the focus for the fruit that God wants to grow within us is peace. Peace. And just as those words come out of my mouth, I am mindful, so, so very mindful that in this gathering, I guarantee you that there are many, even in our gathering today, for whom peace has been this elusive, uh, this elusive pursuit for years. Because no matter what you've done, you've never been able to get to a place where you feel truly content and at peace. It's as if maybe it's been years since you've experienced something that you would call peace or anything near the realm of what you would call peace because you've lived in seasons of tumultuous anxiety. And I just pray that for just a few more moments, you lean in to this message that God has brought to us today. And and I wonder if we start with trying to make sure we understand the words we're using. We use peace to describe a great many things. We think of tranquil babbling brooks in meadows and soft music and things that conjure an environment, a vibe of peace. But the kind of peace that I'm talking about, which can endure life's toughest storms, has nothing to do with how we feel. I wonder if I can give you a reminder of two words that are used in the Bible, two words that are actually dominant in both the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament, our Christian scriptures. 
Let's just start, for example, in the Old Testament. If you don't know a lick of Hebrew, everybody knows one word in Hebrew. I don't even have to prime it. I don't have to prime the pump. You know what it is. Uh, give me your, your one Hebrew word. Shalom. Oh, somebody said like two or three other words, I think. Okay. <laughs> Rabbi Jordan, are you in the room? I don't know. Okay. Shalom. And shalom, we understand at the very base level, means Peace is the word that is translated peace in the Hebrew Bible. But many times we think that peace is simply a feeling of, of contentment or satisfaction. But all through the Hebrew Bible, shalom means literally a state of completeness or wholeness or soundness or harmony. It was in a state of shalom that God created all the world. And everything in the world and everyone in the world, well, they were, they were whole and we were whole and, and we were whole and, and everything was in a state of perfect harmony and then something broke that harmony. And we've been living dissonant lives ever since. Shalom is a word that is meant to describe what used to be whole and has now come to a state of brokenness and is now returned or put back together to a state of wholeness and completion and intactness. Are you with me? A couple of easy examples from the Psalter. From Psalm number 29, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with shalom, blesses his people with wholeness because God knows that we are fragmented people. Another psalm, Psalm 4, in shalom I will lay down, in, with an intact heart, with a, a complete mind, I will lay down, lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And maybe one of the more, more popular or more well-known blessings of the book of Numbers from the priest Aaron. We know these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. What greater blessing can you give or receive to anyone than to wish someone who is broken the wholeness of God? To bring the completeness of God as a blessing over their broken lives. Now, that's the Hebrew word, shalom. In the New Testament, it's exactly the same. In the New Testament, the word that we use to describe peace, that elusive fruit that we can't seem to grow on our own, is a word pronounced this way, arene. Irene may be the very first Greek word I ever learned at about seven or eight because my grandmother, whose name was Irene, taught us early on that she was named for the Greek word for peace, which confounded everyone really in the family. I don't know how that sometimes works, but, but it means peace, but it doesn't just mean peace. It means to be brought back to a state of wholeness, all the essential parts, now track with me, all the essential parts that have been scattered are now gathered in Irene. And that brings such a beautiful meaning to the, extra meaning to the words of Jesus in, in John 14 when we hear these words, peace, Irene, I leave with you, my wholeness, my intactness, I leave and give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. Or we read again in John's gospel, these words, I have told you these things, Jesus says, so that in me you may have hyrene, wholeness, completeness, intactness. But notice where you gather that kind of wholeness so that in me, in me, you may have this kind of peace. In this world, you will have trouble, I promise you. And that is from the lips of uh, those, those lips divine, Jesus, our, our Lord. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And maybe one of the most beautiful reminders in Scripture comes from Philippians. Just one more example here. Oh. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the irene, the wholeness of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So all through the Bible, both of the dominant words that are used to describe this elusive fruit, peace, are words that are not meant to describe a feeling at all. In fact, in the Bible, peace is not a feeling. In fact, I may even say it this way, peace is not the absence of some kind of trouble you have in your life. It's not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of one who can empower you to face your trouble and overcome your trouble because you are with him. Now, I'm going to back the car up and take another run at that again because I want you to hear that clean, all right? Peace is not the absence of trouble, which is why we live so disappointed with the lack of perceived peace in our lives. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of the one who empowers us with strength to face our trouble head on and overcome it by faith. So I want you to remember it in a simpler way this way. Hear these words. Peace is not a feeling that comes through striving, but a fruit that comes through surrender. Now, beloved, I'm just telling you from a couple of reliable sources. One very reliable source is everything I read in this book about peace tells me that it can't come through any striving of my own, but it can only come through surrender to the only one who gives reliable peace to anyone. The other source is my own failed lives, my own failed life. The only other source are my own mistakes. Only places where I've tried to create peace on my, on my own and for myself, learning only to surrender and suddenly find myself strangely liberated from the task of trying to create peace and yet find myself gifted by the grace of the one who understands and has walked with me through the storm. Are you with me? I think that sometimes many of us don't experience peace, not because we don't want it and not because we don't need it and not because it's not available and not because God doesn't want to grant it, but here's the trouble. If both of these words, shalom and irene, tell us that peace is the thing that comes after something has been broken and God puts it back together, if that's what peace is all about, the trouble is whenever we get to whatever it is that has broken us, most of us don't know what to do with the broken pieces. We don't know what to do with the broken pieces. We know how it feels to have been shattered by something. But what we tend to do in attempt to live and survive and move forward past whatever thing you've been through is we take these these broken pieces of whatever fell apart and we do a couple of things with them. You know what one thing we do? One thing we do is sometimes whenever a part of our life breaks or a relationship breaks or a vocation is lost or a location is, is transferred somewhere and you're, now you're living in a city not your own and you don't, whatever it is that is broken the comfort of familiarity and predictability in your life. We sometimes look for the broom in order to kind of sweep up all the pieces of the thing that fell apart and we just kind of scoop it up. But then you know what we do with that pile of of, of brokenness? We find the trash, we bind it up and take it out whenever your trash runs in your neighborhood and the HOA comes around and picks, picks it up. The trouble is peace can't come through simply removing all the broken parts as if they never existed. Peace won't come through denying the thing that was and now is no longer. You know, a few years ago, I was changing my garage a little bit so I could do some woodworking in there. And so I was putting a big piece of pegboard. You know what a pegboard is. You put your tools on it. You hang stuff on it. And, and I was putting a piece of pegboard on one of my walls. And I was hammering away, just aggressively pounding away so that, so that I could put this big pegboard up. And I had forgotten for a moment that the wall that I was hammering against is a wall that is shared with our dining room. Until I heard this thunderous crash inside. I I walked inside to see the shelf had fallen and this beautiful glass punch bowl that we had was in a thousand pieces all over the floor. 
So I did what you're going to do, mm, you know, and I clean it. I get the broom and I sweep it up. I gather all the pieces. Uh, I put it in the can and I take it. That's where it's going to go. They'll come on Monday, pick that stuff up. It's going to be fine. I cleaned it up. It was gone. And then about four days later, I was walking barefoot through my dining room. Oh, yeah. And, and on some carpet, some, some rug that's in there, there was a, a piece of what had broken and it found me. <laughs> It found my foot, foot in the most painful way. And what's my point? My, my point is sometimes we live with the illusion that if we just sweep it all up and get rid of it, it won't come back to find us one day. And it will. It will. Unless we do something with it that is more reliable than me or you. But, you know, so, so sometimes we sweep it away. We try to get rid of it as if it was never there. The brokenness never happened. Oh, we'll be fine. How are, you, how are you after the after the funeral and after the transition and after the move and after the divorce? How, how are you going through this with the kid and the, and the thing, the program they went through? Oh, we're fine. Everything's fine now. Everything's much better. In fact, I'm, you're feeling good. Everything's ship shape. And then we walk in the most vulnerable of days barefoot through some room in some season in our lives and, and we find ourselves punctured again by the pain of something that wasn't dealt with yeah you know that's not all we do though can I tell you something else we do the reason we go without peace sometimes is not because we don't want it not because we don't need it not because it's not available and not because God doesn't want to grant it but sometimes we go without peace because well let me tell you a story a few years ago uh, there was this celebrity auction in Denver Colorado it was to, to benefit the hospice of greater Denver. And all these celebrities donated their stuff. And all these celebrities came and bid on the stuff. It was a great money maker. And one of the items in the auction was a beautiful porcelain mask that had been hand painted by the singer John Denver. And so this was, you know, just a couple of weeks before his tragic plane accident that took his life. And so he was still alive, but it was a great, a great uh, auction piece. So the, the, one of the women who bid most won the bid. Her name was Rita Coors. Yeah, that one. Some of you may know her family name. That's another sermon altogether. And she bought it for $7,000. She was so excited. She went up to the vendor, sold once, twice, boom, sold to the lady with $7,000. She came up and she, she was to receive her porcelain uh, mask and she drops it. Yeah, it shatters in a thousand pieces. And instead of getting all bent out of shape about it, she, she kind of, she got the broom and, and she, she swept it up and she, t she took it home and, and, and she placed it on a, on a, on a shelf and decided, I can't put it back together. So, and so she put a picture of John Denver and one of his albums as a kind of memoriam. Now, if I wanted to, what I could do today is I could preach a very real truth that sometimes, and it's beautiful, it's beautiful, that sometimes the greater beauty only comes after something is broken. I mean, if I wanted to, I could preach that. I don't know, Ron, if I have time today, but, I, it's the, <laughs> but if, I, if I would, I, I would say something about don't fret the broken fragments of your life because it's in the broken fragments that God is intending to bring something beautiful that could not have been as beautiful had it not been broken. And now I'm just testifying. If I could just, I'm just, now I'm just testifying. But the other thing I think about is, is, is the reason some of us don't go, don't experience peace is not because we sweep it away, but sometimes, I got to thinking about this and this story this week, because sometimes we idolize our brokenness. Do you know anybody who went through a thing and it broke them and they can't let it let go of them, and it's as if we put our pain and our trouble and our crisis and all the shame that had come with the brokenness before, and we put it on some shelf so every once in a while we can just keep looking at it and be reminded, oh, I'm just so awful. And that thing, and, and, and this person was responsible for it, or that, that boss I worked with, or, or, or me, and, I, and I, I see it, and Oh gosh, I'm so awful. And we just leave it on the shelf so that we can see and never have peace with God, never have peace with others, never have peace with ourselves because we idolize our brokenness. But the kind of peace that, can I just stay with there for a moment? Do you realize, you realize we do that? We go to extremes. We either throw it away like it never happened or we hang on to it until its grip around us is firmer than our grip around it. 
God's peace is a different kind of peace. It's not a peace that is whimsical. It's not a peace that you are in control of decorating. God's peace comes from another place altogether. Now, this is where we have fun for the last 11 minutes of the sermon. I want to introduce to you a word that is one of the greatest words in the entire New Testament. Maybe all of Scripture. It is a great word. It is a word that, that summarizes everything. If you've been looking for peace, all you got to do is read this word and you're going to feel much better. Here it is. <laughs> Don't you feel good already? Don't you feel great already? Listen, that word is anakaphaliasathai. Anakaphaliasathai. And we'll talk about the anakaphaliasis thigh in just a moment, but, but it's a, you know, that's, a, I think, eight syllables, 19 letters, and it has a particular meaning. Here's the definition of anakaphaliasis <laughs> To gather up, sum up, bring together, unify, unite, and bring back Together, anakaphaliasis thigh only occurs two times in the entire book. And one place where it shows up is in a passage in a New Testament letter that is describing God's greatest hope for all humankind. In fact, the first 14 verses of this book of Ephesians chapter 1, the first 14 verses are one long run-on sentence where the writer can't stop talking about how powerful God's passion is to bring everything together that has been broken since Eden because Eden is where the mask, the beautiful porcelain mask of humankind was shattered on the floor and God has seen fragments and shards of the Edenic mask that was broken all over the place. So when we find our way to Ephesians chapter 1, here is how this word is used and described with all wisdom and insight. God, he, God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good, his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Now, let me stop there for a moment. That's all one big setup so that you know what his plan is for the fullness of time. With all wisdom, insight, he's made known the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure set forth in Christ, a plan for the fullness of time. And what is that plan, you may ask? What is that plan, you may ask? I thank you. I'm glad you asked. It is this, to gather up all things in him, in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. And right there, that phrase, gather up all things in him, is where we find our friend Anakathalathistai, which literally means, if you break the word apart, ana, which means to pull up, to go, to go upward, to elevate, to tug in an upward direction, ana, kafele, head, kafele, head, to gather up into some kind of head everything that had been scattered. If I were to summarize God's greatest intent in the world, I would summarize these, ver these words this way. God has revealed God's deepest desire. The thing that brings God the greatest delight is that in Christ, he has set forth a plan for the fullness of time. And that plan is to gather back up, to unite, to bring back together under one head, all things. All things in heaven, and all things in earth, and I might just say all things in you. Every broken thing, every lost thing, every disappointing thing, every part of your life that was fragmented into pieces on the floor in whatever season that you're thinking about right now. And I know you know what season you're thinking about. Whatever it was that fell apart, God's greatest desire is to pull all of that back together into one unifying head, Christ, Jesus, the Lord of life. And in him find a unity and a wholeness and a peace that cannot be found anywhere else. Sometimes we just want to put our broken parts behind us. All of the causes of our lack of peace, 
We just want to wish it behind us and away. But all of those parts belong. Every hurtful part belongs. Every disappointing part that led you to the very edge of despair, it belongs because it is a part of God's holistic, peace-giving redemption plan for you. If I were to sum it up another way, I'd say, give Jesus your pieces. Give Jesus your pieces. Every single piece that is broken and you wish were not a part of your story, give him your pieces. The pieces from the past and the pieces that you can't predict or control in your future, give them to Jesus. Because this brings light to that beautiful hymn in the first chapter of Colossians that describes what God will do if you give him all the pieces of you. Listen to these words. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself, to himself, into one head, himself, all things. Now here it is. Whether by earth or in heaven, by making arene, by making wholeness, by making completeness, by making shalom through the blood of his cross. How is the blood of his cross capable of bringing you wholeness because the whole point of the blood of his cross was that God was willing to sacrifice and die and become broken so that you don't have to live broken and that forever you may be able to live whole with him starting now and ending never. The question is, what will you do with the pieces of you? If I could put it one way that just burns in your memory for the rest of Father's Day, can I put it this way? For God to give you any peace, you've got to bring God every peace. For God to give you any peace, you've got to bring God every peace. The pieces you're proud of and you're willing to show off and put on a shelf and show friends when they come and the pieces that you would rather lock in a closet in some room that nobody even ha- knows you have in your home. If you want God to give any peace, you must give to God every piece. And maybe that's you today. Maybe we're at a place today where you've been hearing us talk about what the Spirit wants to do, the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of Christ in this world, what he wants to do for you. And maybe something has been a barrier between you and and that peace that is so elusive. Well, maybe the barrier is relinquishment. So right where you are today, I wonder... If maybe it's possible, there is some part of you that you have not yet yielded to Christ. Even now, as in a prayerful um, moment that we think about our own lives and what we hold back and what we give to God, I wonder if in this moment you want to give more to Christ but don't know which way to go and what words to use. I wonder if you might borrow my words right here and right now. Christ, I am weary of carrying this load alone. In fact, I am weary, I am exhausted trying to find a way to create a little bit of peace in my marriage, a little bit of peace for my children, a little bit of peace among coworkers. I'm exhausted because it's as if it's something I can't seem to produce or manufacture. And, and God, if it's possible, would you do in me whatever you desire to do so that that peace grows like a fruit from you right now. And I I confess to you my sins and I submit to the authority and the power of your love to cleanse me from those sins and to renew my heart like like a new creation. I am yours, Lord. From this day forward, there is none but you. And I give you my heart in the name of Christ, my my Lord. Amen. Friends, maybe you prayed that prayer just now. Here is your second step. Tell someone. You're not meant to carry this load alone, and you're not meant to share that, that joy of being set free all alone. Somebody needs to hear about it, and we want to know 
That's why the pastors at this time are coming to the front of the sanctuary and we'll remain here until the end of our benediction, postured and and ready to listen to you, to pray with you, to to see what it is that, that God may be up to in your life so that we might pray together toward the the fruition of whatever it is that God is up to in your life. It might be that you've given your life to Christ and you know today among the 57 others in the last five months who have become members of this church, you know today that you're number 58, 59, 60. You know that you want to be a part of a family of faith that takes this journey seriously and takes each other seriously. And we bring our imperfections to this place, not our perfections. And you come today, talk to one of these pastors, and we will guide you into your next steps. It might be that that next step is that you have never entered into the waters of baptism to declare to all the universe that you are his and he is yours and you've been made new. You come today. Don't wait another week and tell us that you're ready. And we will prepare you for your next step in the journey. But whatever it is that is in your heart, I pray you don't wait another week. Come right after the benediction. But now, we've come to a point in our service that is the most important critical point, where we take our faith seriously and walk by faith outside these, this campus, off this campus, and we, we turn this gathering into a scattering, really, where we go and live deliberately out there in such a way that demonstrates we actually believe everything that we've affirmed in here. If you're ready to do that by the power of Christ working in you, then as you're able, will you stand to your feet? (sighs) Beloved, it fills this pastor's heart with more love and, and, and joy than it can contain to declare to you that wherever you go from this place, the living Christ will go before you to prepare your way. Christ will go behind you in the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step forward at a time. Christ will go to your right and Christ to your left abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. Christ will go above you on the days when you see those dark clouds rolling in to remind you there is one who above the clouds has the other final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But Christ, most importantly, will go in you transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his. Amen.